Chapter 15 Mr. Woodhouse was soon ready for his tea, and when he had drank his tea he was quite ready to go home, and it was as much as his three companions could do to entertain away his notice of the lateness of the hour, before the other gentlemen appeared. Mr. Weston was chatty and convivial, and no friend to early separations of any sort, but at last the drawing-room party did receive an augmentation. Mr. Elton, in very good spirits, was one of the first to walk in. Mrs. Weston and Emma were sitting together on a sofa. He joined them immediately, and with scarcely an invitation, seated himself between them. Emma, in good spirits, too, from the amusement afforded her mind by the expectation of Mr. Frank Churchill, was willing to forget his late improprieties, and be as well satisfied with him as before, and on his making Harriet his first subject, was ready to listen with most friendly smiles. He professed himself extremely anxious about her fair friend, her fair, lovely, amiable friend. Did she know? Had she heard anything about her since their being at Randalls? He felt much anxiety. He must confess that the nature of her complaint alarmed him considerably." And in this style he talked on for some time very properly, not much attending to any answer, but altogether sufficiently awake to the terror of a bad sore throat, and Emma was quite in charity with him. But at last there seemed a perverse turn. It seemed all at once as if he were more afraid of its being a bad sore throat on her account than on Harriet's, more anxious that she should escape the infection, than that there should be no infection in the complaint. He began with great earnestness to entreat her to refrain from visiting the sick chamber again for the present, to entreat her to promise him not to venture into any such hazard till he had seen Mr. Perry and learnt his opinion, and though she tried to laugh it off and bring the subject back into its proper course, there was no putting an end to his extreme solicitude about her. She was vexed. It did appear there was no concealing it, exactly like the pretence of being in love with her, instead of Harriet an inconstancy, if real, the most contemptible and abominable, and she had difficulty in behaving with temper. He turned to Mrs. Weston to implore her assistance. Would not she give him her support? Would not she add her persuasions to his, to induce Miss Woodhouse not to go to Mrs. Goddard's, till it was certain that Miss Smith's disorder had no infection? He could not be satisfied without a promise. Would not she give him her influence in procuring it? So scrupulous for others! he continued, and yet so careless for herself. She wanted me to nurse my cold by staying at home to-day, and yet will not promise to avoid the danger of catching an ulcerated sore throat herself. Is this fair, Mrs. Weston? Judge between us. Have not I some right to complain? I am sure of your kind support and aid." Emma saw Mrs. Weston's surprise, and felt that it must be great at an address which, in words and manner, was assuming to himself the right of first interest in her. And as for herself, she was too much provoked and offended to have the power of directly saying anything to the purpose. She could only give him a look, but it was such a look as she thought must restore him to his senses, and then left the sofa, removing to a seat by her sister, and giving her all her attention. She had not time to know how Mr. Elton took the reproof, so rapidly did another subject succeed, for Mr. John Knightley now came into the room from examining the weather, and open on them all with the information of the ground being covered with snow, and of it still snowing fast, with a strong drifting wind, concluding with these words to Mr. Woodhouse. "'This will prove a spirited beginning of your winter engagement, sir. Something new for your coachmen and horses to be making their way through a storm of snow.' Poor Mr. Woodhouse was silent from consternation, but everybody else had something to say. Everybody was either surprised or not surprised, and had some question to ask, or some comfort to offer. Mrs. Weston and Emma tried earnestly to cheer him and turn his attention from his son-in-law, who was pursuing his triumph rather unfeelingly. "'I admired your resolution very much, sir,' said he, in venturing out in such weather, for of course you saw there would be snow very soon. Everybody must have seen the snow coming on. I admired your spirit, and I dare say we shall all get home very well. Another hour or two's snow can hardly make the road impassable. And we are two carriages. If one is blown over in the bleak part of the common field, there will be the other at hand. I dare say we shall all be safe at Hartfield before midnight." Mr. Weston, with triumph of a different sort, was confessing that he had known it to be snowing some time, but had not said a word 
lest it should make Mr. Woodhouse uncomfortable, and be an excuse for his hurrying away. As to there being any quantity of snow fallen or likely to fall to impede their return, that was a mere joke. He was afraid they would find no difficulty. He wished the road might be impassable, that he might be able to keep them all at Randall's, and with the utmost good will was sure that accommodation might be found for everybody, calling on his wife to agree with him, that with a little contrivance, everybody might be lodged, which she hardly knew how to do, from the consciousness of there being but two spare rooms in the house. "'What is to be done, my dear Emma? What is to be done?' was Mr. Woodhouse's first exclamation, and all that he could say for some time. To her he looked for comfort, and her assurances of safety, her representation of the excellence of the horses and of James, and of their having so many friends about them, revived him a little. His eldest daughter's alarm was equal to his own. The horror of being blocked up at Randall's while her children were at Hartfield was full in her imagination, and fancying the road to be now just passable for adventurous people, but in a state that admitted no delay, she was eager to have it settled that her father and Emma should remain at Randall's, while she and her husband set forward instantly through all the possible accumulations of drifted snow that might impede them. "'You had better order the carriage directly, my love,' said she. "'I dare say we shall be able to get along, if we set off directly. And if we do come to anything very bad, I can get out and walk. I am not at all afraid. I should not mind walking half the way. I could change my shoes, you know, the moment I got home, and it is not the sort of thing that gives me cold." "'Indeed,' replied he. "'Then, my dear Isabella, it is the most extraordinary sort of thing in the world, for in general everything does give you cold. Walk home. You are prettily shod for walking home, I dare say. It will be bad enough for the horses." Isabella turned to Mrs. Weston for her approbation of the plan. Mrs. Weston could only approve. Isabella then went to Emma. But Emma could not so entirely give up the hope of their all being able to get away, and they were still discussing the point, when Mr. Knightley, who had left the room immediately after his brother's first report of the snow, came back again and told them that he had been out of doors to examine, and could answer for there not being the smallest difficulty in their getting home whenever they liked it, either now or an hour hence. He had gone beyond the sweep, some way along the Highbury Road. The snow was nowhere above half an inch deep, in many places hardly enough to whiten the ground. A very few flakes were falling at present, but the clouds were parting, and there was every appearance of its being soon over. He had seen the coachman, and they both agreed with him in there being nothing to apprehend. To Isabella the relief of such tidings was very great, and they were scarcely less acceptable to Emma on her father's account, who was immediately set as much at ease on the subject as his nervous constitution allowed. But the alarm that had been raised could not be appeased so as to admit of any comfort for him while he continued at Randall's. He was satisfied of there being no present danger in returning home, but no assurances could convince him that it was safe to stay, and while the others were variously urging and recommending, Mr. Knightley and Emma settled it in a few brief sentences, thus. "'Your father will not be easy. Why do you not go?' "'I am ready, if the others are.' "'Shall I ring the bell?' "'Yes, do.' and the bell was rung, and the carriage is spoken for. A few minutes more, and Emma hoped to see one troublesome companion deposited in his own house, to get sober and cool, and the other recover his temper and happiness when this visit of hardship were over. The carriage came, and Mr. Woodhouse, always the first object on such occasions, was carefully attended to his own by Mr. Knightley and Mr. Weston, but not all that either could say could prevent some renewal of alarm at the sight of the snow which had actually fallen, and the discovery of a much darker night than he had been prepared for. He was afraid they should have a very bad drive. He was afraid poor Isabella would not like it. And there would be poor Emma in the carriage behind. He did not know what they had best do. They must keep as much together as they could." And James was talked to, and given a charge to go very slow and wait for the other carriage. Isabella stepped in after her father. John Knightley, forgetting that he did not belong to their party, stepped in after his wife very naturally, so that Emma found, on being escorted and followed into the second carriage by Mr. Elton, that the door was to be lawfully shut on them, and that they were to have a tête-à-tête -tête drive. It would not have been the awkwardness of a moment, it would have been rather a pleasure, previous to the suspicion of this very day, she could have talked to him of Harriet, and the three-quarters of a mile would have seemed but one. But now she would rather it had not happened, 
She believed he had been drinking too much of Mr. Weston's good wine, and felt sure that he would want to be talking nonsense. To restrain him as much as might be, by her own manners, she was immediately preparing to speak with exquisite calmness and gravity of the weather and the night. But scarcely had she begun. Scarcely had they passed the sweep-gate and joined the other carriage, than she found her subject cut up, her hand seized, her attention demanded, and Mr. Elton actually making violent love to her, availing himself of the precious opportunity, declaring sentiments which must be already well known, hoping, fearing, adoring, ready to die if she refused him, but flattering himself that his ardent attachment and unequalled love and unexampled passion could not fail of having some effect, and in short, very much resolved on being seriously accepted as soon as possible. It really was so. Without scruple, without apology, without much apparent diffidence, Mr. Elton, the lover of Harriet, was professing himself her lover. She tried to stop him, but vainly. He would go on and say it all. Angry as she was, the thought of the moment made her resolve to restrain herself when she did speak. She felt that half this folly must be drunkenness, and therefore could hope it might only belong to the passing hour. Accordingly, with a mixture of the serious and the playful, which she hoped would best suit his half and half state, she replied, "'I am very much astonished, Mr. Elton. This to me! You forget yourself. You take me for my friend. Any message to Miss Smith I shall be happy to deliver. But no more of this to me, if you please.' "'Miss Smith! Message to Miss Smith! What could she possibly mean?' and he repeated her words with such assurance of accent, such boastful pretence of amazement, that she could not help replying with quickness, "'Mr. Elton, this is the most extraordinary conduct, and I can account for it only in one way. You are not yourself, or you could not speak either to me or of Harriet in such a manner. Command yourself enough to say no more, and I will endeavour to forget it.' But Mr. Elton had only drunk wine enough to elevate his spirits, not at all to confuse his intellects. He perfectly knew his own meaning, and having warmly protested against her suspicion as most injurious, and slightly touched upon his respect for Miss Smith as her friend, but acknowledging his wonder that Miss Smith should be mentioned at all, he resumed the subject of his own passion, and was very urgent for a favourable answer. As she thought less of his inebriety, she thought more of his inconstancy and presumption and with fewer struggles for politeness, replied, "'It is impossible for me to doubt any longer. You have made yourself too clear. Mr. Elton, my astonishment is much beyond anything I can express. After such behaviour as I have witnessed during the last month to Miss Smith, such attentions as I have been in the daily habit of observing, to be addressing me in this manner, this is an unsteadiness of character indeed, which I had not supposed possible. Believe me, sir, I am far, very far, from gratified in being the object of such professions." "'Good heaven!' cried Mr. Elton. "'What can be the meaning of this? Miss Smith! I never thought of Miss Smith in the whole course of my existence. Never paid her any attentions, but as your friend. Never cared whether she were dead or alive, but as your friend. If she has fancied otherwise, her own wishes have misled her, and I am very sorry, extremely sorry. But Miss Smith, indeed! Oh, Miss Woodhouse! Who can think of Miss Smith when Miss Woodhouse is near? No, upon my honour, there is no unsteadiness of character. I have thought only of you. I protest against having paid the smallest attention to any one else. Everything that I have said or done for many weeks past has been with the sole view of marking my adoration of yourself. You cannot really seriously doubt it. No! in an accent meant to be insinuating, I am sure you have seen and understood me." It would be impossible to say what Emma felt on hearing this, which of all her unpleasant sensations was uppermost. She was too completely overpowered to be immediately able to reply, and two moments of silence being ample encouragement for Mr. Elton's sanguine state of mind, he tried to take her hand again, as he joyously exclaimed, "'Charming, Miss Woodhouse! Allow me to interpret this interesting silence. It confesses that you have long understood me." "'No, sir,' cried Emma. "'It confesses no such thing. So far from having long understood you, I have been in a most complete error with respect to your views till this moment. As to myself, I am very sorry that you should have been giving way to any feelings. Nothing could be farther from my wishes. 
your attachment to my friend Harriet, your pursuit of her, pursuit it appeared, gave me great pleasure, and I have been very earnestly wishing you success. But had I supposed that she were not your attraction to Hartfield, I should certainly have thought you judged ill in making your visits so frequent. Am I to believe that you have never sought to recommend yourself particularly to Miss Smith, that you have never thought seriously of her?" "'Never, madam,' cried he, affronted in his turn. "'Never, I assure you, I think seriously of Miss Smith. Miss Smith is a very good sort of girl, and I should be happy to see her respectably settled. I wish her extremely well, and no doubt there are men who might not object to— Everybody has their level, but as for myself, I am not, I think, quite so much at a loss. I need not so totally despair of an equal alliance as to be addressing myself to Miss Smith. No, madam, my visits to Hartfield have been for yourself only, and the encouragement I received. Encouragement! I give you encouragement. Sir, you have been entirely mistaken in supposing it. I have seen you only as the admirer of my friend. In no other light could you have been more to me than a common acquaintance. I am exceedingly sorry, but it is well that the mistake ends where it does. Had the same behaviour continued, Miss Smith might have been led into a misconception of your views. Not being aware, probably, any more than myself, of the very great inequality which you are so sensible of. But as it is, the disappointment is single, and I trust will not be lasting. I have no thoughts of matrimony at present." He was too angry to say another word, her manner too decided to invite supplication, and in this state of swelling resentment and mutually deep mortification, they had to continue together a few minutes longer, for the fears of Mr. Woodhouse had confined them to a foot-pace. If there had not been so much anger, there would have been desperate awkwardness, but their straightforward emotions left no room for the little zigzags of embarrassment. Without knowing when the carriage turned into Vicarage Lane, or when it stopped, they found themselves all at once at the door of his house, and he was out before another syllable passed. Emma then felt it indispensable to wish him a good night. The compliment was just returned, coldly and proudly, and under indescribable irritation of spirits, she was then conveyed to Hartfield. There she was welcomed with the utmost delight by her father, who had been trembling for the dangers of a solitary drive from Vicarage Lane, turning a corner which he could never bear to think of, and in strange hands, a mere common coachman, no James, and there it seemed as if her return only were wanted to make everything go well, for Mr. John Knightley, ashamed of his ill-humour, was now all kindness and attention, and so particularly solicitous for the comfort of her father, as to seem, if not quite ready to join him in a basin of gruel, perfectly sensible of its being exceedingly wholesome. And the day was concluding in peace and comfort to all their little party, except herself. But her mind had never been in such perturbation, and it needed a very strong effort to appear attentive and cheerful, till the usual hour of separating allowed her the relief of quiet reflection. CHAPTER Sixteen. The hair was curled and the maid sent away, and Emma sat down to think and be miserable. It was a wretched business indeed, such an overthrow of everything she had been wishing for, such a development of everything most unwelcome, such a blow for Harriet. That was the worst of all. Every part of it brought pain and humiliation of some sort or other, but compared with the evil to Harriet, all was light and she would gladly have submitted to feel yet more mistaken, more in error, more disgraced by misjudgment than she actually was, could the effects of her blunders have been confined to herself. If I had not persuaded Harriet into liking the man, I could have borne anything. He might have doubled his presumption to me. But poor Harriet! How she could have been so deceived! He protested that he had never thought seriously of Harriet, never! She looked back as well as she could, but it was all confusion. She had taken up the idea, she supposed, and made everything bend to it. His manners, however, must have been unmarked, wavering, dubious, or she could not have been so misled. The picture! How eager he had been about the picture! And the charade! And an hundred other circumstances! How clearly they had seemed to point at Harriet! To be sure, the charade, with its ready wit! But then, the soft eyes! In fact, it suited neither, it was a jumble without taste or truth. Who could have seen through such thick-headed nonsense? 
Certainly she had often, especially of late, thought his manners to herself unnecessarily gallant. But it had passed as his way, as a mere error of judgment, of knowledge, of taste, as one proof among others that he had not always lived in the best society, that with all the gentleness of his address, true elegance was sometimes wanting. But till this very day she had never for an instant suspected it to mean anything but grateful respect to her as Harriet's friend. To Mr. John Knightley she was indebted for her first idea on the subject, for the first start of its possibility. There was no denying that those brothers had penetration. She remembered what Mr. Knightley had once said to her about Mr. Elton, the caution he had given, the conviction he had professed that Mr. Elton would never marry indiscreetly, and blushed to think how much truer a knowledge of his character had been there shown than any she had reached herself. It was dreadfully mortifying. But Mr. Elton was proving himself, in many respects, the very reverse of what she had meant and believed him proud, assuming, conceited, very full of his own claims, and little concerned about the feelings of others. Contrary to the usual course of things, Mr. Elton's wanting to pay his addresses to her had sunk him in her opinion. His professions and his proposals did him no service. She thought nothing of his attachment, and was insulted by his hopes. He wanted to marry well, and having the arrogance to raise his eyes to her, pretended to be in love but she was perfectly easy as to his not suffering any disappointment that need be cared for. There had been no real affection either in his language or manners. Sighs and fine words had been given in abundance, but she could hardly devise any set of expressions, or fancy any tone of voice, less allied with real love. She need not trouble herself to pity him. He only wanted to aggrandize and enrich himself and of Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield, the heiress of thirty thousand pounds, were not quite so easily obtained as he had fancied, he would soon try for Miss Somebody Else with twenty, or with ten. But that he should talk of encouragement, and should consider her as aware of his views, accepting his attentions, meaning, in short, to marry him, should suppose himself her equal in connection or mind, look down upon her friend, so well understanding the gradations of rank below him, and be so blind to what rose above, as to fancy himself showing no presumption in addressing her. It was most provoking. Perhaps it was not fair to expect him to feel how very much he was her inferior in talent, and all the elegancies of mind. The very want of such equality might prevent his perception of it. But he must know that in fortune and consequence she was greatly his superior. He must know that the Woodhouses had been settled for several generations at Hartfield, the younger branch of a very ancient family, and that the Eltons were nobody. The landed property of Hartfield certainly was inconsiderable, being but a sort of notch in the Donwell Abbey estate, to which all the rest of Highbury belonged. But their fortune, from other sources, was such as to make them scarcely secondary to Donwell Abbey itself, in every other kind of consequence and the Woodhouses had long held a high place in the consideration of the neighbourhood, which Mr. Elton had first entered not two years ago, to make his way as he could, without any alliances but in trade, or anything to recommend him to notice but his situation and his civility. But he had fancied her in love with him. That evidently must have been his dependence. And after raving a little about the seeming incongruity of gentle manners and a conceited head, Emma was obliged in common honesty to stop, and admit that her own behaviour to him had been so complacent and obliging, so full of courtesy and attention, as, supposing her real motive unperceived, might warrant a man of ordinary observation and delicacy, like Mr. Elton, in fancying himself a very decided favourite. If she had so misinterpreted his feelings, she had little right to wonder that he, with self-interest to blind him, should have mistaken hers. The first error and the worst lay at her door. It was foolish, it was wrong, to take so active a part in bringing any two people together. It was adventuring too far, assuming too much, making light of what ought to be serious, a trick of what ought to be simple. She was quite concerned and ashamed, and resolved to do such things no more. "'Here have I,' said she, "'actually talked poor Harriet into being very much attached to this man. She might never have thought of him but for me, and certainly never would have thought of him with hope, if I had not assured her of his attachment, for she is as modest and humble as I used to think him. Oh, that I might have been satisfied with persuading her not to accept young Martin! There I was quite right. 
That was well done of me. But there I should have stopped, and left the rest to time and chance. I was introducing her into good company, and giving her the opportunity of pleasing some one worth having. I ought not to have attempted more. But now, poor girl, her peace is cut up for some time. I have been but half a friend to her, and if she were not to feel this disappointment so very much, I am sure I have not an idea of anybody else who would be at all desirable for her. William Cox! Oh, no! I could not endure William Cox, a pert young lawyer!" She stopped to blush and laugh at her own relapse, and then resumed a more serious, more dispiriting cogitation upon what had been, and might be, and must be. The distressing explanation she had to make to Harriet, and all that poor Harriet would be suffering, with the awkwardness of future meetings, the difficulties of continuing or discontinuing the acquaintance, of subduing feelings, concealing resentment, and avoiding éclat, were enough to occupy her in most unmirthful recollections some time longer, and she went to bed at last with nothing settled but the conviction of her having blundered most dreadfully. To youth and natural cheerfulness like Emma's, though under temporary gloom at night, the return of day will hardly fail to bring return of spirits. The youth and cheerfulness of morning are in happy analogy, and of powerful operation, and if the distress be not poignant enough to keep the eyes unclosed, they will be sure to open to sensations of soft and pained and brighter hope. Emma got up on the morrow more disposed for comfort than she had gone to bed, more ready to see alleviations of the evil before her, and to depend on getting tolerably out of it. It was a great consolation that Mr. Elton should not really be in love with her, or so particularly amiable as to make it shocking to disappoint him, that Harriet's nature should not be of that superior sort in which the feelings are most acute and retentive, and that there could be no necessity for anybody's knowing what had passed except the three principles, and especially for her father's being given a moment's uneasiness about it. These were very cheering thoughts, and the sight of a great deal of snow on the ground did her further service, for anything was welcome that might justify their all three being quite asunder at present. The weather was most favourable for her, though Christmas Day she could not go to church. Mr. Woodhouse would have been miserable had his daughter attempted it, and she was therefore safe from either exciting or receiving unpleasant and most unsuitable ideas. The ground covered with snow, and the atmosphere in that unsettled state between frost and thaw, which is of all others the most unfriendly for exercise, every morning beginning in rain or snow, and every evening setting into freeze, she was for many days a most honourable prisoner. No intercourse with Harriet possible but by note, no church for her on Sunday any more than on Christmas Day, and no need to find excuses for Mr. Elton's absenting himself. It was weather which might fairly confine everybody at home, and though she hoped and believed him to be really taking comfort in some society or other, it was very pleasant to have her father so well satisfied with his being all alone in his own house, too wise to stir out, and to hear him say to Mr. Knightley, whom no weather could keep entirely from them, "'Ah, Mr. Knightley, why do you not stay at home like poor Mr. Elton?' These days of confinement would have been, but for her private perplexities, remarkably comfortable, as such seclusion exactly suited her brother, whose feelings must always be of great importance to his companions, and he had besides so thoroughly cleared off his ill-humour at Randall's, that his amiableness never failed him during the rest of his stay at Hartfield. He was always agreeable and obliging, and speaking pleasantly of everybody. But with all the hopes of cheerfulness, and all the present comfort of delay, there was still such an evil hanging over her in the hour of explanation with Harriet, as made it impossible for Emma to be ever perfectly at ease. CHAPTER Seventeen. Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley were not detained long at Hartfield. The weather soon improved enough for those to move who must move, and Mr. Woodhouse having, as usual, tried to persuade his daughter to stay behind with all her children, was obliged to see the whole party set off, and return to his lamentations over the destiny of poor Isabella, which poor Isabella, passing her life with those she doted on, full of their merits, blind to their faults, and always innocently busy, might have been a model of right feminine happiness. The evening of the very day on which they went brought a note from Mr. Elton to Mr. Woodhouse, a long, civil, ceremonious note, to say, with Mr. Elton's best compliments, that he was proposing to leave Highbury the following morning in his way to Bath, where, in compliance with the pressing entreaties of some friends, he had engaged to spend a few weeks, 
and very much regretted the impossibility he was under, from various circumstances of weather and business, of taking a personal leave of Mr. Woodhouse, of whose friendly civilities he should ever retain a grateful sense, and had Mr. Woodhouse any commands, should be happy to attend to them. Emma was most agreeably surprised. Mr. Elton's absence just at this time was the very thing to be desired. She admired him for contriving it, though not able to give him much credit for the manner in which it was announced. Resentment could not have been more plainly spoken, than in a civility to her father, from which she was so pointedly excluded. She had not even a share in his opening compliments. Her name was not mentioned, and there was so striking a change in all this, and such an ill-judged solemnity of leave-taking in his graceful acknowledgments, as she thought at first could not escape her father's suspicion. It did, however. Her father was quite taken up with the surprise of so sudden a journey, and his fears that Mr. Elton might never get safely to the end of it, and saw nothing extraordinary in his language. It was a very useful note, for it supplied them with fresh matter for thought and conversation during the rest of their lonely evening. Mr. Woodhouse talked over his alarms, and Emma was in spirits to persuade them away with all her usual promptitude. She now resolved to keep Harriet no longer in the dark. She had reason to believe her nearly recovered from her cold, and it was desirable that she should have as much time as possible for getting the better of her other complaint, before the gentleman's return. She went to Mrs. Goddard's accordingly the very next day, to undergo the necessary penance of communication. And a severe one it was. She had to destroy all the hopes which she had been so industriously feeding, to appear in the ungracious character of the one preferred, and acknowledge herself grossly mistaken and misjudging in all her ideas on one subject, all her observations, all her convictions, all her prophecies for the last six weeks. The confession completely renewed her first shame, and the sight of Harriet's tears made her think that she should never be in charity with herself again. Harriet bore the intelligence very well blaming nobody, and in everything testifying such an ingenuousness of disposition, and lowly opinion of herself, as must appear with particular advantage at that moment to her friend. Emma was in the humour to value simplicity and modesty to the utmost, and all that was amiable, all that ought to be attaching, seemed on Harriet's side, not her own. Harriet did not consider herself as having anything to complain of. The affection of such a man as Mr. Elton would have been too great a distinction. She never could have deserved him and nobody but so partial and kind a friend as Miss Woodhouse would have thought it possible. Her tears fell abundantly, but her grief was so truly artless, that no dignity could have made it more respectable in Emma's eyes, and she listened to her and tried to console her with all her heart and understanding, really for the time convinced that Harriet was a superior creature of the two, and that to resemble her would be more for her own welfare and happiness than all that genius or intelligence could do. It was rather too late in the day to set about being simple-minded and ignorant, but she left her with every previous resolution confirmed of being humble and discreet, and repressing imagination all the rest of her life. Her second duty now, inferior only to her father's claims, was to promote Harriet's comfort, and endeavour to prove her own affection in some better method than by matchmaking. She got her to Hartfield and showed her the most unvarying kindness, striving to occupy and amuse her, and by books and conversation, to drive Mr. Elton from her thoughts. Time, she knew, must be allowed for this being thoroughly done, and she could suppose herself but an indifferent judge of such matters in general, and very inadequate to sympathise in an attachment to Mr. Elton in particular. But it seemed to her reasonable that at Harriet's age, and with the entire extinction of all hope, such a progress might be made towards a state of composure, by the time of Mr. Elton's return, as to allow them all to meet again in the common routine of acquaintance, without any danger of betraying sentiments or increasing them. Harriet did think him all perfection, and maintained the non-existence of anybody equal to him in person or goodness, and did, in truth, prove herself more resolutely in love than Emma had foreseen but yet it appeared to her so natural, so inevitable to strive against an inclination of that sort unrequited, that she could not comprehend its continuing very long in equal force. If Mr. Elton, on his return, made his own indifference as evident and indubitable as she could not doubt he would anxiously do, she could not imagine Harriet's persisting to place her happiness in the sight or the recollection of him. Their being fixed, so absolutely fixed, in the same place, was bad for each, for all three, not one of them had the power of removal, or of effecting any material change of society. They must encounter each other, 
and make the best of it. Harriet was farther unfortunate in the tone of her companions at Mrs. Goddard's, Mr. Elton being the adoration of all the teachers and great girls in the school, and it must be at Hartfield only that she could have any chance of hearing him spoken of with cooling moderation, or repellent truth. Where the wound had been given, there must the cure be found, if anywhere. And Emma felt that, till she saw her in the way of cure, there could be no true peace for herself. CHAPTER Eighteen. Mr. Frank Churchill did not come. When the time proposed drew near, Mrs. Weston's fears were justified in the arrival of a letter of excuse. For the present he could not be spared, to his very great mortification and regret, but still he looked forward with the hope of coming to Randall's at no distant period. Mrs. Weston was exceedingly disappointed, much more disappointed, in fact, than her husband, though her dependence on seeing the young man had been so much more sober, but a sanguine temper, though for ever expecting more good than occurs, does not always pay for its hopes by any proportionate depression. It soon flies over the present failure, and begins to hope again. For half an hour Mr. Weston was surprised and sorry, but then he began to perceive that Frank's coming two or three months later would be a much better plan, better time of year, better weather, and that he would be able without any doubt to stay considerably longer with them than if he had come sooner. These feelings rapidly restored his comfort, while Mrs. Weston, of a more apprehensive disposition, foresaw nothing but a repetition of excuses and delays, and after all her concern for what her husband was to suffer, suffered a great deal more herself. Emma was not at this time in a state of spirits to care really about Mr. Frank Churchill's not coming, except as a disappointment at Randall's. The acquaintance at present had no charm for her. She wanted rather to be quiet and out of temptation. But still, as it was desirable that she should appear in general like her usual self, she took care to express as much interest in the circumstance, and enter as warmly into Mr. and Mrs. Weston's disappointment as might naturally belong to their friendship. She was the first to announce it to Mr. Knightley, and exclaimed quite as much as was necessary, or, being acting a part, perhaps rather more, at the conduct of the Churchills in keeping him away. She then proceeded to say a good deal more than she felt, of the advantage of such an addition to their confined society in Surrey, the pleasure of looking at somebody new, the gala day to Highbury and Tyre, which the sight of him would have made, and ending with reflections on the Churchills again, found herself directly involved in a disagreement with Mr. Knightley and, to her great amusement, perceived that she was taking the other side of the question from her real opinion, and making use of Mrs. Weston's arguments against herself. "'The Churchills are very likely in fault,' said Mr. Knightley coolly. "'But I dare say he might come if he would.' "'I do not know why you should say so. He wishes exceedingly to come. But his aunt and uncle will not spare him.' "'I cannot believe that he has not the power of coming, if he made a point of it. It is too unlikely for me to believe it without proof.' How odd you are! What has Mr. Frank Churchill done to make you suppose him such an unnatural creature?" "'I am not supposing him at all an unnatural creature, in suspecting that he may have learnt to be above his connections, and to care very little for anything but his own pleasure, from living with those who have always set him the example of it. It is a great deal more natural than one could wish, that a young man, brought up by those who are proud, luxurious, and selfish, should be proud, luxurious, and selfish too. If Frank Churchill had wanted to see his father, he would have contrived it between September and January. A man at his age—what is he? A three or four and twenty? Cannot be without the means of doing as much as that. It is impossible." "'That's easily said and felt by you, who have always been your own master. You are the worst judge in the world, Mr. Knightley, of the difficulties of dependence. You do not know what it is to have tempers to manage." It is not to be conceived that a man of three or four and twenty should not have liberty of mind or limb to that amount. He cannot want money. He cannot want leisure. We know, on the contrary, that he has so much of both, that he is glad to get rid of them at the idlest haunts in the kingdom. We hear of him for ever at some watering-place or other. A little while ago he was at Weymouth. This proves that he can leave the Churchills." "'Yes, sometimes he can and those times are whenever he thinks it worth his while, whenever there is any temptation of pleasure. It is very unfair to judge of anybody's conduct, without an intimate knowledge of their situation. Nobody who has not been in the interior of a family, can say what the difficulties of any individual of that family may be. 
we ought to be acquainted with Enscombe, and with Mrs. Churchill's temper, before we pretend to decide upon what her nephew can do. He may, at times, be able to do a great deal more than he can at others." "'There is one thing, Emma, which a man can always do if he chooses, and that is, his duty. Not by manoeuvring and finessing, but by vigour and resolution. It is Frank Churchill's duty to pay this attention to his father. He knows it to be so, by his promises and messages. But if he wished to do it, it might be done. A man who felt rightly would say at once, simply and resolutely, to Mrs. Churchill, "'Every sacrifice of mere pleasure you will always find me ready to make to your convenience. But I must go and see my father immediately. I know he would be hurt by my failing in such a mark of respect to him on the present occasion. I shall therefore set off to-morrow. If he would say so to her at once, in the tone of decision becoming a man, there would be no opposition made to his going." "'No,' said Emma, laughing. "'But perhaps there might be some made to his coming back again. Such language for a young man entirely dependent to use! Nobody but you, Mr. Knightley, would imagine it possible." "'But you have not an idea of what is requisite in situations directly opposite to your own. Mr. Frank Churchill, to be making such a speech as that to the uncle and aunt, who have brought him up, and are to provide for him! Standing up in the middle of the room, I suppose, and speaking as loud as he could! How can you imagine such conduct practicable?" "'Depend upon it, Emma. A sensible man would find no difficulty in it. He would feel himself in the right. And the declaration, made, of course, as a man of sense would make it, in a proper manner, would do him more good, raise him higher, fix his interest stronger with the people he depended on, than all that a line of shifts and expedients can ever do. Respect would be added to affection. They would feel that they could trust him, that the nephew who had done rightly by his father would do rightly by them for they know, as well as he does, as well as all the world must know, that he ought to pay this visit to his father, and while meanly exerting their power to delay it, are in their hearts not thinking the better of him for submitting to their whims. Respect for right conduct is felt by everybody. If he would act in this sort of manner, on principle, consistently, regularly, their little minds would bend to his." "'I rather doubt that. You are very fond of bending little minds. But where little minds belong to rich people in authority, I think they have a knack of swelling out, till they are quite as unmanageable as great ones. I can imagine that if you, as you are, Mr. Knightley, were to be transported and placed all at once in Mr. Frank Churchill's situation, you would be able to say and do just what you have been recommending for him, and it might have a very good effect. The Churchills might not have a word to say in return. But then you would have no habits of early obedience and long observance to break through. To him who has, it might not be so easy to burst forth at once into perfect independence, and set all their claims on his gratitude and regard at naught. He may have as strong a sense of what would be right as you can have, without being so equal under particular circumstances to act up to it." "'Then it would not be so strong a sense. If it failed to produce equal exertion, it could not be an equal conviction." Oh, the difference of situation and habit! I wish you would try to understand what an amiable young man may be likely to feel in directly opposing those whom, as child and boy, he has been looking up to all his life." Our amiable young man is a very weak young man, if this be the first occasion of his carrying through a resolution to do right against the will of others. It ought to have been a habit with him by this time of following his duty, instead of consulting expediency. I can allow for the fears of the child, but not of the man. As he became rational, he ought to have roused himself, and shaken off all that was unworthy in their authority. He ought to have opposed the first attempt on their side to make him slight his father. Had he begun as he ought, there would have been no difficulty now." "'We shall never agree about him,' cried Emma. But that is nothing extraordinary. I have not the least idea of his being a weak young man. I feel sure that he is not. Mr. Weston would not be blind to folly, though in his own son, but he is very likely to have a more yielding, complying, mild disposition, than would suit your notions of a man's perfection. I dare say he has, and though it may cut him off from some advantages, it will secure him many others." "'Yes, all the advantages of sitting still when he ought to move, and of leading a life of mere idle pleasure, and fancying himself extremely expert in finding excuses for it.' 
He can sit down and write a fine, flourishing letter, full of professions and falsehoods, and persuade himself that he has hit upon the very best method in the world of preserving peace at home, and preventing his father's having any right to complain. His letters disgust me." "'Your feelings are singular. They seem to satisfy everybody else." "'I suspect they do not satisfy Mrs. Weston. They hardly can satisfy a woman of her good sense and quick feelings standing in a mother's place, but without a mother's affection, to blind her. It is on her account that attention to Randall's is doubly due, and she must doubly feel the omission. Had she been a person of consequence herself, he would have come, I dare say, and it would not have signified whether he did or no. Can you think your friend behind hand in these sort of considerations? Do you suppose she does not often say all this to herself? No, Emma, your amiable young man can be amiable only in French, not in English. He may be very aimable, have very good manners, and be very agreeable, but he can have no English delicacy toward the feelings of other people, nothing really amiable about him." "'You seem determined to think ill of him.' "'Me? Not at all,' replied Mr. Knightley, rather displeased. "'I do not want to think ill of him. I should be as ready to acknowledge his merits as any other man. But I hear of none except what are merely personal, that he is well-grown and good-looking, with smooth, plausible manners." "'Well, if he have nothing else to recommend him, he will be a treasure at Highbury. We do not often look upon fine young men, well-bred and agreeable. We must not be nice, and ask for all the virtues into the bargain. Cannot you imagine, Mr. Knightley, what a sensation his coming will produce? There will be but one subject throughout the parishes of Donwell and Highbury, and one interest, one object of curiosity. It will be all Mr. Frank Churchill. We shall think and speak of nobody else." "'You will excuse my being so much overpowered. If I find him conversable, I shall be glad of his acquaintance. But if he is only a chattering coxcomb, he will not occupy much of my time or thoughts." "'My idea of him is, that he can adapt his conversation to the taste of everybody and has the power as well as the wish of being universally agreeable. To you he will talk of farming, to me of drawing or music, and so on to everybody, having that general information on all subjects which will enable him to follow the lead, or take the lead, just as propriety may require, and to speak extremely well on each. That is my idea of him." "'And mine,' said Mr. Knightley warmly is, that if he turn out anything like it, he will be the most insufferable fellow breathing. What! At three and twenty to be the king of his company, the great man, the practised politician, who is to read everybody's character, and make everybody's talents conduce to the display of his own superiority, to be dispensing his flatteries around that he may make all appear like fools compared with himself? My dear Emma, your own good sense could not endure such a puppy when it came to the point. I will say no more about him," said Emma. You turn everything to evil. We are both prejudiced, you against, I for him, and we have no chance of agreeing till he is really here." Prejudiced? I am not prejudiced. But I am very much, and without being at all ashamed of it. My love for Mr. and Mrs. Weston gives me a decided prejudice in his favour. He is a person whom I never think of from one month's end to another said Mr. Knightley, with a degree of vexation, which made Emma immediately talk of something else, though she could not comprehend why he should be angry. To take a dislike to a young man, only because he appeared to be of a different disposition from himself, was unworthy the real liberality of mind which she was always used to acknowledge in him. For with all the high opinion of himself, which she had often laid to his charge, she had never before for a moment supposed it could make him unjust to the merit of another. Volume Two, Chapter One. Emma and Harriet had been walking together one morning, and in Emma's opinion had been talking enough of Mr. Elton for that day. She could not think that Harriet's solace or her own sins required more, and she was therefore industriously getting rid of the subject as they returned. But it burst out again when she thought she had succeeded, and after speaking some time of what the poor must suffer in winter, and receiving no other answer than a very plaintive, "'Mr. Elton is so good to the poor,' she found something else must be done. They were just approaching the house where lived Mrs. and Miss Bates. She determined to call upon them and seek safety in numbers. 
There was always sufficient reason for such an attention. Mrs. and Miss Bates loved to be called on, and she knew she was considered by the very few who presumed ever to see imperfection in her, as rather negligent in that respect, and as not contributing what she ought to the stock of their scanty comforts. She had had many a hint from Mr. Knightley, and some from her own heart as to her deficiency. But none were equal to counteract the persuasion of its being very disagreeable, a waste of time, tiresome women, and all the horror of being in danger of falling in with the second-rate and third-rate of Highbury, who were calling on them for ever, and therefore she seldom went near them. But now she made the sudden resolution of not passing their door without going in observing, as she proposed it to Harriet, that as well as she could calculate, they were just now quite safe from any letter from Jane Fairfax. The house belonged to people in business. Mrs. and Miss Bates occupied the drawing-room floor, and there, in the very moderate-sized apartment which was everything to them, the visitors were most cordially and even gratefully welcomed. The quiet, neat old lady, who with her knitting was seated in the warmest corner, wanting even to give up her place to Miss Woodhouse, and her more active, talking daughter, almost ready to overpower them with care and kindness, thanks for their visit, solicitude for their shoes, anxious inquiries after Mr. Woodhouse's health, cheerful communications about her mother's, and sweet cake from the buffet. Mrs. Cole had just been there, just called in for ten minutes, and had been so good as to sit an hour with them, and she had taken a piece of cake, and been so kind as to say she liked it very much, and therefore she hoped Miss Woodhouse and Miss Smith would do them the favour to eat a piece too. The mention of the Coles was sure to be followed by that of Mr. Elton. There was intimacy between them, and Mr. Cole had heard from Mr. Elton since his going away. Emma knew what was coming. They must have the letter over again, and settle how long he had been gone, and how much he was engaged in company, and what a favourite he was wherever he went, and how full the master of the ceremony's ball had been. And she went through it very well, with all the interest and all the commendation that could be requisite, and always putting forward to prevent Harriet's being obliged to say a word. This she had been prepared for when she entered the house but meant, having once talked him handsomely over, to be no farther incommoded by any troublesome topic, and to wander at large amongst all the mistresses and misses of Highbury, and their card-parties. She had not been prepared to have Jane Fairfax succeed Mr. Elton. But he was actually hurried off by Miss Bates. She jumped away from him at last abruptly to the coals, to usher in a letter from her niece. Oh, yes! Mr. Elton, I understand, certainly as to dancing. Mrs. Cole was telling me that dancing in the rooms at Bath was— Mrs. Cole was so kind as to sit some time with us, talking of Jane, for as soon as she came in she began inquiring after her. Jane is so very great a favourite there. Whenever she is with us, Mrs. Cole does not know how to shew her kindness enough, and I must say that Jane deserves it as much as anybody can. And so she began inquiring after her directly, saying, I know you cannot have heard from Jane lately, because it is not her time for writing. And when I immediately said, But indeed we have, we had a letter this very morning. I do not know that ever I saw anybody more surprised. Have you upon your honour? said she. Well, that is quite unexpected. Do let me hear what she says. Emma's politeness was at hand directly, to say with smiling interest, Have you heard from Miss Fairfax so lately? I am extremely happy. I hope she is well." "'Thank you. You are so kind,' replied the happily deceived aunt, while eagerly hunting for the letter. "'Oh, here it is! I was sure it could not be far off. But I had put my huswife upon it, you see, without being aware, and so it was quite hid. But I had it in my hand so very lately that I was almost sure it must be on the table. I was reading it to Mrs. Cole, and since she went away I was reading it again to my mother, for it is such a pleasure to her, a letter from Jane, that she can never hear it often enough. So I knew it could not be far off, and here it is, only just under my huswife. And since you are so kind as to wish to hear what she says, but first of all I really must, in justice to Jane, apologise for her writing so short a letter. Only two pages, you see, hardly two, and in general she fills the whole paper and crosses half. My mother often wonders that I can make it out so well. She often says, when the letter is first opened, "'Well, Hetty, now I think you will be put to it to make out all that checker work. Don't you, ma'am?' 
and then I tell her I am sure she would contrive to make it out herself if she had nobody to do it for her, every word of it. I am sure she would pore over it till she had made out every word. And indeed, though my mother's eyes are not so good as they were, she can see amazingly well still, thank God, with the help of spectacles. It is such a blessing. My mother's are really very good indeed. Jane often says, when she is here, I am sure, Grandmamma, you must have had very strong eyes to see as well as you do, and so much fine work as you have done too. I only wish my eyes may last me as well." All this spoken extremely fast obliged Miss Bates to stop for breath, and Emma said something very civil about the excellence of Miss Fairfax's handwriting. "'You are extremely kind,' replied Miss Bates, highly gratified. You, who are such a judge, and write so beautifully yourself, I am sure there is nobody's praise that could give us so much pleasure as Miss Woodhouse's. My mother does not hear. She is a little deaf, you know. Ma'am, addressing her, do you hear what Miss Woodhouse is so obliging to say about Jane's handwriting? And Emma had the advantage of hearing her own silly compliment repeated twice over, before the good old lady could comprehend it. She was pondering in the meanwhile upon the possibility, without seeming very rude, of making her escape from Jane Fairfax's letter, and had almost resolved on hurrying away directly under some slight excuse, when Miss Bates turned to her again and seized her attention. "'My mother's deafness is very trifling, you see, just nothing at all. By only raising my voice and saying anything two or three times over, she is sure to hear. But then, she is used to my voice. But it is very remarkable that she should always hear Jane better than she does me. Jane speaks so distinct. However, she will not find her grandmamma at all deafer than she was two years ago, which is saying a great deal at my mother's time of life. And it really is full two years, you know, since she was here. We never were so long without seeing her before, and as I was telling Mrs. Cole, we shall hardly know how to make enough of her now." "'Are you expecting Miss Fairfax here soon?' "'Oh, yes! Next week!' Indeed, that must be a very great pleasure. Thank you. You are very kind. Yes, next week everybody is so surprised, and everybody says the same obliging things. I am sure she will be as happy to see her friends at Highbury as they can be to see her. Yes, Friday or Saturday. She cannot say which, because Colonel Campbell will be wanting the carriage himself one of those days. So very good of them to send her the whole way. But they always do, you know. Oh, yes, Friday or Saturday next. That is what she writes about. That's the reason of her writing out of rule, as we call it. For in the common course we should not have heard from her before next Tuesday or Wednesday." Yes, so I imagined. I was afraid there could be little chance of my hearing anything of Miss Fairfax to-day. So obliging of you! No, we should not have heard it, if not been for this particular circumstance of her being to come here so soon. My mother is so delighted, for she is to be three months with us at least. Three months, she says so, positively, as I am going to have the pleasure of reading to you. The case is, you see, that the Campbells are going to Ireland. Mrs. Dixon has persuaded her father and mother to come over and see her directly. They had not intended to go over till the summer, but she is so impatient to see them again, for till she married last October she was never away from them so much as a week, which must make it very strange to be in different kingdoms, I was going to say, but however different countries, and so she wrote a very urgent letter to her mother or her father, I declare I do not know which it was, but we shall see presently in Jane's letter, wrote in Mr. Dixon's name as well as her own, to press their coming over directly, and they would give them the meeting in Dublin, and take them back to their country seat, Bally Craig, a beautiful place, I fancy. Jane has had a great deal of its beauty, from Mr. Dixon, I mean. I do not know that she ever heard about it from anybody else. But it was very natural, you know, that he should like to speak of his own place, while he was paying his addresses, and as Jane used to be very often walking out with them, for Colonel and Mrs. Campbell were very particular about their daughters not walking out often with only Mr. Dixon, for which I do not at all blame them. Of course she heard everything he might be telling Miss Campbell about his own home in Ireland, and I think she wrote us word that he had shown them some drawings of the place, views that he had taken taken himself. He is a most amiable, charming young man, I believe. Jane was quite longing to go to Ireland from his account of things." At this moment, an ingenious and animating suspicion entering Emma's brain with regard to Jane Fairfax, this charming Mr. Dixon, and the not going to Ireland, she said, with the insidious design of farther discovery, "'You must feel it very fortunate that Miss Fairfax should be allowed to come to you at such a time. Considering the very particular friendship between her and Mrs. Dixon, you could hardly have expected her to be excused from accompanying Colonel and Mrs. Campbell." 
"'Very true, very true indeed. The very thing that we have always been rather afraid of. For we should not have liked to have her at such distance from us, for months together, not able to come if anything was to happen. But you see, everything turns out for the best. They want her, Mr. and Mrs. Dixon, excessively to come over with Colonel and Mrs. Campbell, quite depend upon it. Nothing can be more kind or pressing than their joint invitation, Jane says, as you will hear presently. Mr. Dixon does not seem in the least backward in any attention. He is a most charming young man. Ever since the service he rendered at Jane at Weymouth, when they were out in that party on the water, and she, by the sudden whirling round of something or other among the sails, would have been dashed into the sea at once, and actually was all but gone, if he had not, with the greatest presence of mind, caught hold of her habit. I can never think of it without trembling. But ever since we had the history of that day, I have been so fond of Mr. Dixon." But in spite of her friend's urgency, and her own wish of seeing Ireland, Miss Fairfax prefers devoting the time to you and Mrs. Bates. Yes, entirely her own doing, entirely her own choice, and Colonel and Mrs. Campbell think she does quite right, just what they should recommend, and indeed they particularly wish her to try her native air, as she has not been quite so well as usual lately. I am concerned to hear of it. I think they judge wisely. But Mrs. Dixon must be very much disappointed. Mrs. Dixon, I understand, has no remarkable degree of personal beauty, is not by any means to be compared with Miss Fairfax?" "'Oh, no! You are very obliging to say such things, but certainly not. There is no comparison between them. Miss Campbell always was absolutely plain, but extremely elegant and amiable." "'Yes, that of course. Jane caught a bad cold, poor thing, so long ago as the 7th of November, as I am going to read to you, and has never been well since. A long time is it not for a cold to hang upon her? She never mentioned it before, because she would not alarm us. Just like her, so considerate! But, however, she is so far from well, that her kind friends the Campbells think she had better come home, and try an air that always agrees with her, and they have no doubt that three or four months at Highbury will entirely cure her and it is certainly a great deal better that she should come here than go to Ireland, if she is unwell. Nobody could nurse her as we should do." "'It appears to me the most desirable arrangement in the world. And so she is to come to us next Friday or Saturday, and the Campbells leave town and their way to Holyhead the Monday following, as you will find from Jane's letter. So sudden! You may guess, dear Miss Woodhouse, what a flurry it has thrown me in, if it would not for the drawback of her illness but I am afraid we must expect to see her grown thin and looking very poorly. I must tell you what an unlucky thing happened to me as to that. I always make a point of reading Jane's letters through to myself first, before I read them aloud to my mother, you know, for fear of there being anything in them to distress her. Jane desired me to do it, so I always do. And so I began to-day with my usual caution. But no sooner did I come to the mention of her being unwell, than I burst out quite frightened with, "'Bless me! Poor Jane is ill!' which my mother, being on the watch, heard distinctly, and was sadly alarmed at. However, when I read on, I found it was not near so bad as I had fancied at first, and I make so light of it now to her that she does not think about it much. But I cannot imagine how I could be so off my guard. If Jane does not get well soon, we will call in Mr. Perry. The expense shall not be thought of, and though he is so liberal and so fond of Jane that I dare say he would not mean to charge anything for attendance, we could not suffer it to be so, you know. He has a wife and a family to maintain, and is not to be giving away his time. Well, now I have just given you a hint of what Jane writes about, we will turn to her letter, and I am sure she tells her own story a great deal better than I can tell it for her." "'I am afraid we must be running away,' said Emma, glancing at Harriet and beginning to rise. My father will be expecting us. I had no intention, I thought I had no power of staying more than five minutes when I first entered the house. I merely called, because I would not pass the door without inquiring after Mrs. Bates. But I have been so pleasantly detained. Now, however, we must wish you and Mrs. Bates good morning." And not all that could be urged to detain her succeeded. She regained the street. Happy in this, that though much had been forced on her against her will, though she had in fact heard the whole substance of Jane Fairfax's letter, she had been able to escape the letter itself. CHAPTER Two. Jane Fairfax was an orphan, the only child of Mrs. Bates's youngest daughter. The marriage of Lieutenant Fairfax of the Blank Regiment of Infantry, and Miss Jane Bates, had had its day of fame and pleasure, hope and interest. But now nothing remained of it, 
save the melancholy remembrance of him dying in action abroad, of his widow sinking under consumption and grief soon afterwards, and this girl. By birth she belonged to Highbury, and when at three years old, on losing her mother, she became the property, the charge, the consolation, the fondling of her grandmother and aunt, there had seemed every probability of her being permanently fixed there, of her being taught only what very limited means could command, and growing up with no advantages of connection or improvement, to be engrafted on what nature had given her in a pleasing person, good understanding, and warm-hearted, well-meaning relations. But the compassionate feelings of a friend of her father gave a change to her destiny. This was Colonel Campbell, who had very highly regarded Fairfax, as an excellent officer and most deserving young man, and farther had been indebted to him for such attentions, during a severe camp fever, as he believed had saved his life. These were claims which he did not learn to overlook, though some years passed away from the death of poor Fairfax, before his own return to England put anything in his power. When he did return, he sought out the child and took notice of her. He was a married man with only one living child, a girl about Jane's age, and Jane became their guest, paying them long visits and growing a favourite with all, and before she was nine years old, his daughter's great fondness for her, and his own wish of being a real friend, united to produce an offer from Colonel Campbell of undertaking the whole charge of her education. It was accepted, and from that period Jane had belonged to Colonel Campbell's family, and had lived with them entirely, only visiting her grandmother from time to time. The plan was that she should be brought up for educating others, the very few hundred pounds which she inherited from her father, making independence impossible. To provide for her otherwise was out of Colonel Campbell's power, for though his income by pay and appointments was handsome, his fortune was moderate and must be all his daughter's. But by giving her an education, he hoped to be supplying the means of respectable subsistence hereafter. Such was Jane Fairfax's history. She had fallen into good hands, known nothing but kindness from the Campbells, and been given an excellent education. Living constantly with right-minded and well-informed people, her heart and understanding had received every advantage of discipline and culture, and Colonel Campbell's residence being in London, every lighter talent had been done full justice to, by the attendance of first-rate masters. Her disposition and abilities were equally worthy of all that friendship could do, and at eighteen or nineteen she was, as far as such an early age can be qualified for the care of children, fully competent to the office of instruction herself, but she was too much beloved to be parted with. Neither father nor mother could promote, and the daughter could not endure it. The evil day was put off. It was easy to decide that she was still too young, and Jane remained with them sharing, as another daughter, in all the rational pleasures of an elegant society, and a judicious mixture of home and amusement, with only the drawback of the future, the sobering suggestions of her own good understanding, to remind her that all this might soon be over. The affection of the whole family, the warm attachment of Miss Campbell in particular, was the more honourable to each party from the circumstance of Jane's decided superiority, both in beauty and acquirements. That nature had given it in feature could not be unseen by the young woman, nor could her higher powers of mind be unfelt by the parents. They continued together with unabated regard, however, till the marriage of Miss Campbell, who by that chance, that luck which so often defies anticipation in matrimonial affairs, giving attraction to what is moderate rather than to what is superior, engaged the affections of Mr. Dixon a young man, rich and agreeable, almost as soon as they were acquainted, and was eligibly and happily settled, while Jane Fairfax had yet her bread to earn. This event had very lately taken place, too lately for anything to be yet attempted by her less fortunate friend towards entering on her path of duty, though she had now reached the age which her own judgment had fixed on for beginning. She had long resolved that one and twenty should be the period. With the fortitude of a devoted novitiate, she had resolved at one and twenty to complete the sacrifice, and retire from all the pleasures of life, of rational intercourse, equal society, peace and hope, to penance and mortification for ever. The good sense of Colonel and Mrs. Campbell could not oppose such a resolution, though their feelings did. As long as they lived, no exertions would be necessary, their home might be hers for ever, and for their own comfort they would have retained her wholly. But this would be selfishness. What must be at last had better be soon. 
perhaps they began to feel it might have been kinder and wiser to have resisted the temptation of any delay, and spared her from a taste of such enjoyments of ease and leisure as must now be relinquished. Still, however, affection was glad to catch at any reasonable excuse for not hurrying on the wretched moment. She had never been quite well since the time of their daughter's marriage, and till she should have completely recovered her usual strength, they must forbid her engaging in duties, which, so far from being compatible with a weakened frame and varying spirits, seemed, under the most favourable circumstances, to require something more than human perfection of body and mind to be discharged with tolerable comfort. With regard to her not accompanying them to Ireland, her account to her aunt contained nothing but truth though there might be some truths not told. It was her own choice to give the time of their absence to Highbury, to spend, perhaps, her last months of perfect liberty with those kind relations to whom she was so very dear. And the Campbells, whatever might be their motive or motives, whether single or double or treble, gave the arrangement their ready sanction, and said that they depended more on a few months spent in her native air for the recovery of her health than on anything else. Certain it was that she was to come and that Highbury, instead of welcoming that perfect novelty which had been so long promised it, Mr. Frank Churchill, must put up for the present with Jane Fairfax, who could bring only the freshness of a two years' absence. Emma was sorry. To have to pay civilities to a person she did not like through three long months, to be always doing more than she wished, and less than she ought, why she did not like Jane Fairfax might be a difficult question to answer. Mr. Knightley had once told her it was because she saw in her the really accomplished young woman which she wanted to be thought herself. And though the accusation had been eagerly refuted at the time, there were moments of self-examination in which her conscience could not quite acquit her. But she could never get acquainted with her. She did not know how it was, but there was such coldness and reserve, such apparent indifference whether she pleased or not. And then her aunt was such an eternal talker, and she was made such a fuss with by everybody. And it had always been imagined that they were to be so intimate, because their ages were the same, everybody had supposed they must be so fond of each other. These were her reasons. She had no better. It was a dislike so little just, every imputed fault was so magnified by fancy, that she never saw Jane Fairfax the first time after any considerable absence, without feeling that she had injured her. And now, when the due visit was paid, on her arrival, after a two years' interval, she was particularly struck with the very appearance and manners, which for those two whole years she had been depreciating. Jane Fairfax was very elegant, remarkably elegant and she had herself the highest value for elegance. Her height was pretty, just such as almost everybody would think tall, and nobody could think very tall. Her figure particularly graceful, her size a most becoming medium, between fat and thin, though a slight appearance of ill-health seemed to point out the likeliest evil of the two. Emma could not but feel all this, and then her face, her features. There was more beauty in them altogether than she had remembered. It was not regular, but it was a very pleasing beauty. Her eyes, a deep grey, with dark eyelashes and eyebrows, had never been denied their praise. But the skin, which she had been used to cavil at, as wanting colour, had a clearness and delicacy which really needed no fuller bloom. It was a style of beauty of which elegance was the reigning character and as such she must, in honour by all her principles, admire it. Elegance, which, whether of person or of mind, she saw so little in Highbury. There, not to be vulgar, was distinction and merit. In short, she sat, during the first visit, looking at Jane Fairfax with twofold complacency, the sense of pleasure and the sense of rendering justice, and was determining that she would dislike her no longer when she took in her history, indeed her situation, as well as her beauty, when she considered what all this elegance was destined to, what she was going to sink from, how she was going to live, it seemed impossible to feel anything but compassion and respect, especially if to every well-known particular entitling her to interest were added the highly probable circumstance of an attachment to Mr. Dixon, which she had so naturally started to herself. In that case, nothing could be more pitiable or more honourable than the sacrifices she had resolved on. 
Emma was very willing now to acquit her of having seduced Mr. Dixon's actions from his wife, or of anything mischievous which her imagination had suggested at first. If it were love, it might be simple, single, successless love on her side alone. She might have been unconsciously sucking in the sad poison, while a share of his conversation with her friend, and from the best, the purest of motives, might now be denying herself this visit to Ireland, and resolving to divide herself effectually from him and his connections, by soon beginning her career of laborious duty. Upon the whole, Emma left her with such softened, charitable feelings as made her look around in walking home, and lament that Highbury afforded no young man worthy of giving her independence, nobody she could wish to scheme about for her. These were charming feelings, but not lasting. Before she had committed herself by any public profession of eternal friendship for Jane Fairfax, or done more towards a recantation of past prejudices and errors, than saying to Mr. Knightley, "'She certainly is handsome. She is better than handsome.' Jane had spent an evening at Hartfield with her grandmother and aunt, and everything was relapsing much into its usual state. Former provocations reappeared. The aunt was as tiresome as ever more tiresome, because anxiety for her health was now added to admiration of her powers, and they had to listen to the description of exactly how little bread and butter she ate for breakfast, and how small a slice of mutton for dinner, as well as to see exhibitions of new caps and new work-bags for her mother and herself, and Jane's offences rose again. They had music, Emma was obliged to play, and the thanks and praise which necessarily followed appeared to her an affectation of candour, an air of greatness, meaning only to show off in higher style her own very superior performance. She was, besides, which was the worst of all, so cold, so cautious. There was no getting at her real opinion. Wrapped up in a cloak of politeness, she seemed determined to hazard nothing. She was disgustingly, was suspiciously reserved. If anything could be more where all was most, she was more reserved on the subject of Weymouth and the Dixons than anything. She seemed bent on giving no real insight into Mr. Dixon's character, or her own value for his company, or opinion of the suitableness of the match. It was all general approbation and smoothness, nothing delineated or distinguished. It did her no service, however. Her caution was thrown away. Emma saw its artifice, and returned to her first surmises. There probably was something more to conceal than her own preference. Mr. Dixon, perhaps, had been very near changing one friend for the other, or been fixed only to Miss Campbell, for the sake of the future twelve thousand pounds. The like reserve prevailed on other topics. She and Mr. Frank Churchill had been at Weymouth at the same time. It was known that they were a little acquainted. But not a syllable of real information could Emma procure as to what he truly was. Was he handsome? She believed he was reckoned a very fine young man. Was he agreeable? He was generally thought so. Did he appear a sensible young man, a young man of information? At a watering-place, or in a common London acquaintance, it was difficult to decide on such points. Manners were all that could be safely judged of, under a much longer knowledge than they had had yet of Mr. Churchill. She believed everybody found his manners pleasing. Emma could not forgive her. CHAPTER Three. Emma could not forgive her. But as neither provocation nor resentment were discerned by Mr. Knightley, who had been of the party, and had seen only proper attention and pleasing behaviour on each side, he was expressing the next morning, being at Hartfield again on business with Mr. Woodhouse, his approbation of the whole not so openly as he might have done had her father been out of the room, but speaking plain enough to be very intelligible to Emma. He had been used to think her unjust to Jane, and had now great pleasure in marking an improvement. "'A very pleasant evening,' he began, as soon as Mr. Woodhouse had been talked into what was necessary, told that he understood, and the papers swept away. "'Particularly pleasant. You and Miss Fairfax gave us some very good music. I do not know a more luxurious state, sir, than sitting at one's ease to be entertained a whole evening by two such young women, sometimes with music and sometimes with conversation. I am sure Miss Fairfax must have found the evening pleasant, Emma. You left nothing undone. I was glad you made her play so much, for having no instrument at her grandmother's, it must have been a real indulgence.' 
I am happy you approved," said Emma, smiling. But I hope I am not often deficient in what is due to guests at Hartfield. No, my dear," said her father instantly. That I am sure you are not. There is nobody half so attentive and civil as you are. If anything, you are too attentive. The muffin last night, if it had been handed round once, I think it would have been enough." No said Mr. Knightley, nearly at the same time. You are not often deficient, not often deficient either in manner or comprehension. I think you understand me, therefore." An arch look expressed, I understand you well enough. But she said only, Miss Fairfax is reserved. I always told you she was, a little, but you will soon overcome all that part of her reserve which ought to be overcome all that has its foundation in diffidence. What arises from discretion must be honoured." "'You think her diffident. I do not see it.' "'My dear Emma,' said he, moving from his chair into one close by her, "'you are not going to tell me, I hope, that you had not a pleasant evening?' "'Oh, no! I was pleased with my own perseverance in asking questions, and amused to think how little information I obtained. I am disappointed," was his only answer. "'I hope everybody had a pleasant evening,' said Mr. Woodhouse, in his quiet way. "'I had. Once I felt the fire rather too much. But then I moved back my chair a little, a very little, and it did not disturb me. Miss Bates was very chatty and good-humoured, as she always is, though she speaks rather too quick. However, she is very agreeable, and Mrs. Bates, too, in a different way. I like old friends, and Miss Jane Fairfax is a very pretty sort of young lady, a very pretty and a very well-behaved young lady indeed. She must have found the evening agreeable, Mr. Knightley, because she had Emma." "'True, sir, and Emma because she had Miss Fairfax." Emma saw his anxiety, and wishing to appease it, at least for the present, said, and with a sincerity which no one could question, "'She is a sort of elegant creature that one cannot keep one's eyes from. I am always watching her to admire, and I do pity her from my heart.' Mr. Knightley looked as if he were more gratified than he cared to express, and before he could make any reply, Mr. Woodhouse, whose thoughts were on the Bateses, said, it is a great pity that their circumstances should be so confined, a great pity indeed, and I have often wished, but it is so little one can venture to do, small trifling presence of anything uncommon. Now we have killed a porker, and Emma thinks of sending them a loin or a leg. It is very small and delicate. Hartfield pork is not like any other pork, but still it is pork. And, my dear Emma, unless one could be sure of their making it into steaks nicely fried, as ours are fried, without the smallest grease, and not roast it, for no stomach can bear roast pork, I think we had better send the leg. Do not you think so, my dear?" My dear papa, I sent the whole hind quarter. I knew you would wish it. There will be the leg to be salted, you know, which is so very nice, and the loin to be dressed directly in any manner they like." "'That's right, my dear, very right. I had not thought of it before, but that is the best way. They must not over-salt the leg. And then, if it is not over-salted, and if it is very thoroughly boiled, just as Searl boils ours, and eaten very moderately of, with a boiled turnip and a little carrot or parsnip, I do not consider it unwholesome." "'Emma,' said Mr. Knightley presently, "'I have a piece of news for you. You like news, and I heard an article in my way hither that I think will interest you." "'News? Oh, yes, I always like news. What is it? Why do you smile so? Where did you hear it? At Randall's?" He had time only to say, "'No, not at Randall's. I have not been near Randall's." When the door was thrown open, and Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax walked into the room, full of thanks and full of news, Miss Bates knew not which to give quickest. 
Mr. Knightley soon saw that he had lost his moment, and that not another syllable of communication could rest with him. "'Oh! my dear sir! How are you this morning? My dear Miss Woodhouse, I am quite overpowered! Such a beautiful hind-quarter of pork! You are too bountiful! Have you heard the news? Mr. Elton is going to be married!' Emma had not had time even to think of Mr. Elton, and she was so completely surprised that she could not avoid a little start, and a little blush at the sound. "'There is my news. I thought it would interest you,' said Mr. Knightley, with a smile which implied a conviction of some part of what had passed between them. "'But where could you hear it?' cried Miss Bates. "'Where could you possibly hear it, Mr. Knightley? For it is not five minutes since I received Mrs. Cole's note. No, it cannot be more than five, or at least ten, for I had got my bonnet and spencer on, just ready to come out. I was only gone down to speak to Patty again about the pork. Jane was standing in the passage. Were not you, Jane? For my mother was so afraid that we had not any salting-pan large enough. So I said I would go down and see, and Jane said, Shall I go down instead? For I think you have a little cold, and Patty has been washing the kitchen. Oh, my dear, said I, well, and just then came the note. A Miss Hawkins, that's all I know, a Miss Hawkins of Bath. But, Mr. Knightley, how could you possibly have heard it? For the very moment Mr. Cole told Mrs. Cole of it, she sat down and wrote to me, a Miss Hawkins. I was with Mr. Cole on business an hour and a half ago. He had just read Elton's letter as I was shown in, and handed it to me directly. Well, that is quite— I suppose there was never a piece of news more generally interesting. My dear sir, you really are too bountiful. My mother desires her very best compliments and regards, and a thousand thanks, and says you really quite press her." "'We consider our Hartfield pork,' replied Mr. Woodhouse. "'Indeed, it certainly is so very superior to all other pork, that Emma and I cannot have a greater pleasure than—'Oh, my dear sir, as my mother says, our friends are only too good to us. If ever there were people who, without having great wealth themselves, had everything they could wish for, I am sure it is us. We may well say that our lot is cast in a goodly heritage. Well, Mr. Knightley, and so you actually saw the letter. Well!' It was short, merely to announce, but cheerful, exulting, of course. Here was a sly glance at Emma. He had been so fortunate as to—I forget the precise words, one has no business to remember them. The information was, as you state, that he was going to be married to a Miss Hawkins. By his style, I should imagine it just settled. "'Mr. Elton going to be married?' said Emma, as soon as she could speak. He will have everybody's wishes for his happiness. He is very young to settle, was Mr. Woodhouse's observation. He had better not be in a hurry. He seemed to me very well off as he was. We were always glad to see him at Hartfield. A new neighbour for us all, Miss Woodhouse, said Miss Bates joyfully. My mother is so pleased. She says she cannot bear to have the poor old vicarage without a mistress. This is great news indeed. Jane, you have never seen Mr. Elton. No wonder that you have such a curiosity to see him." Jane's curiosity did not appear of that absorbing nature as wholly to occupy her. "'No, I have never seen Mr. Elton,' she replied, starting on this appeal. "'Is he—is he a tall man?' "'Who shall answer that question?' cried Emma. "'My father would say yes, Mr. Knightley no, and Miss Bates and I that he is just the happy medium. When you have been here a little longer, Miss Fairfax, you will understand that Mr. Elton is the standard of perfection in Highbury, both in person and mind." "'Very true, Miss Woodhouse. So she will. He is the very best young man. But, my dear Jane, if you remember, I told you yesterday he was precisely the height of Mr. Perry. Miss Hawkins! I dare say an excellent young woman, his extreme attention to my mother, wanting her to sit in the vicarage pew that she might hear the better, for my mother is a little deaf, you know. It is not much, but she does not hear quite quick. Jane says that Colonel Campbell is a little deaf. He fancied bathing might be good for it, the warm bath, but she says it did him no lasting benefit. Colonel Campbell, you know, is quite our angel, and Mr. Dixon seems a very charming young man, quite worthy of him. It is such a happiness when good people get together, and they always do. 
Now here will be Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins, and there are the Coles, such very good people, and the Perrys. I suppose there never was a happier or a better couple than Mr. and Mrs. Perry. I say, sir, turning to Mr. Woodhouse, I think there are few places with such society as Highbury. I always say we are quite blessed in our neighbours. My dear sir, if there is one thing my mother loves better than another, it is pork, a roast loin of pork." "'As to who or what Miss Hawkins is, or how long he has been acquainted with her,' said Emma, "'nothing, I suppose, can be known. One feels that it cannot be a very long acquaintance. He has been gone only four weeks.' Nobody had any information to give, and after a few more wonderings, Emma said, "'You are silent, Miss Fairfax. But I hope you mean to take an interest in this news. You who have been hearing and seeing so much of late on these subjects, who must have been so deep in the business on Miss Campbell's account, we shall not excuse your being indifferent about Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins." "'When I have seen Mr. Elton,' replied Jane, "'I dare say I shall be interested. But I believe it requires that with me. And as it is some months since Miss Campbell married, the impression may be a little worn off." "'Yes, he has been gone just four weeks, as you observe, Miss Woodhouse,' said Miss Bates. Four weeks yesterday! A Miss Hawkins! Well, I had always rather fancied it would be some young lady hereabouts. Not that I ever—Mrs. Cole once whispered to me, but I immediately said, "'No, Mr. Elton is a most worthy young man, but—in short, I do not think I am particularly quick at those sorts of discoveries. I do not pretend to it. What is before me, I see. At the same time, nobody could wonder if Mr. Elton should have aspired. Oh, Miss Woodhouse lets me chatter on so good-humouredly. She knows I would not offend for the world. How does Miss Smith do? She seems quite recovered now. Have you heard from Mrs. John Knightley lately? Oh, those dear little children! Jane, do you know I always fancy Mr. Dixon quite like Mr. John Knightley? I mean in person, tall and with that sort of look, and not very talkative." quite wrong, my dear aunt. There is no likeness at all." "'Very odd! But one never does form a just idea of anybody beforehand. One takes up a notion and runs away with it. Mr. Dixon, you say, is not, strictly speaking, handsome." "'Handsome? Oh, no! Far from it. Certainly plain. I told you he was plain." "'My dear! You said that Miss Campbell would not allow him to be plain, and that you yourself—" "'Oh, as for me, my judgment is worth nothing. Where I have a regard, I always think a person well-looking. But I gave what I believed the general opinion, when I called him plain." "'Well, my dear Jane, I believe we must be running away. The weather does not look well, and Grandmamma will be uneasy. You are too obliging, my dear Miss Woodhouse, but we really must take leave. This has been a most agreeable piece of news indeed. I shall just go round by Mrs. Coles, but I shall not stop three minutes. And, Jane, you had better go home directly. I would not have you out in a shower. We think she is the better for Highbury already. Thank you. We do, indeed. I shall not attempt calling on Mrs. Goddard, for I really do not think she cares for anything but boiled pork. When we dress the leg, it will be another thing. Good morning to you, my dear sir. Oh, Mr. Knightley is coming, too. Well, that is so very— I am sure if Jane is tired, you will be so kind as to give her your arm. Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins! Good morning to you." Emma, alone with her father, had half her attention wanted by him while he lamented that young people would be in such a hurry to marry, and to marry strangers, too, and the other half she could give to her own view of the subject. It was to herself an amusing and a very welcome piece of news, as proving that Mr. Elton could not have suffered long. But she was sorry for Harriet. Harriet must feel it and all that she could hope was, by giving the first information herself, to save her from hearing it abruptly from others. It was now about the time that she was likely to call. If she were to meet Miss Bates in her way—and upon its beginning to rain, Emma was obliged to expect that the weather would be detaining her at Mrs. Goddard's, and that the intelligence would undoubtedly rush upon her without preparation. The shower was heavy, but short and it had not been over five minutes, when in came Harriet, with just the heated, agitated look which hurrying thither with a full heart was likely to give, and the, "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, what do you think has happened?' which instantly burst forth, had all the evidence of corresponding perturbation. As the blow was given, Emma felt that she could not show greater kindness than in listening. 
and Harriet, unchecked, ran eagerly through what she had to tell. She had set out from Mrs. Goddard's half an hour ago. She had been afraid it would rain. She had been afraid it would pour down every moment. But she thought she might get to Hartfield first. She had hurried on as fast as possible. But then, as she was passing by the house where a young woman was making up a gown for her, she thought she would just step in and see how it went on. And though she did not seem to stay half a moment there, soon after she came out it began to rain, and she did not know what to do. So she ran on directly, as fast as she could, and took shelter at Ford's. Ford's was the principal woollen draper, linen draper, and haberdasher's shop united, the shop first in size and fashion in the place. And so, there she had sat, without an idea of anything in the world, full ten minutes, perhaps, when all of a sudden, who should come in? To be sure it was so very odd, but they always dealt at Ford's. Who should come in but Elizabeth Martin and her brother? Dear Miss Woodhouse, only think! I thought I should have fainted. I did not know what to do. I was sitting near the door. Elizabeth saw me directly, but he did not. He was busy with the umbrella. I am sure she saw me, but she looked away directly, and took no notice. And they both went to quite the farther end of the shop, and I kept sitting near the door. Oh, dear! I was so miserable! I am sure I must have been as white as my gown. I could not go away, you know, because of the rain, but I did so wish myself anywhere in the world but there. Oh, dear Miss Woodhouse! Well, at last, I fancy, he looked round and saw me, for instead of going on with her buyings, they began whispering to one another. I am sure they were talking of me, and I could not help thinking that he was persuading her to speak to me. Do you think he was, Miss Woodhouse? For presently she came forward, came quite up to me, and asked how I did, and seemed ready to shake hands if I would. She did not do any of it in the same way that she used. I could see that she was altered. But, however, she seemed to try to be quite friendly, and we shook hands, and stood talking some time. But I know no more what I said. I was in such a tremble, and I remember she said she was sorry we never met now which I thought almost too kind. Dear Miss Woodhouse, I was absolutely miserable. By that time it was beginning to hold up, and I was determined that nothing should stop me from getting away. And then, only think, I found he was coming up towards me too, slowly, you know, and as if he did not quite know what to do. And so he came and spoke, and I answered, and I stood for a minute feeling dreadfully, you know, one can't tell how. And then I took courage, and said it did not rain, and I must go, and so off I set. And I had not got three yards from the door when he came after me, only to say if I was going to Hartfield, he thought I had much better go round by Mr. Cole's stables, for I should find the near way quite floated by this rain. Oh, dear! I thought it would have been the death of me! So I said, I was very much obliged to him. You know I could not do less. And then he went back to Elizabeth, and I came round by the stables. I believe I did. But I hardly knew where I was, or anything about it. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I would rather done anything that have it happen. And yet, you know, there was a sort of satisfaction in seeing him behave so pleasantly and so kindly. And Elizabeth, too. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, do talk to me and make me comfortable again." Very sincerely did Emma wish to do so, but it was not immediately in her power. She was obliged to stop and think. She was not thoroughly comfortable herself. The young man's conduct, and his sister's, seemed the result of real feeling, and she could not but pity them. As Harriet described it, there had been an interesting mixture of wounded affection and genuine delicacy in their behaviour. But she had believed them to be well-meaning, worthy people before, and what difference did this make in the evils of the connection? It was folly to be disturbed by it. Of course he must be sorry to lose her, they must all be sorry. Ambition, as well as love, had probably been mortified. They might all have hoped to rise by Harriet's acquaintance. And besides, what was the value of Harriet's description? So easily pleased, so little discerning, what signified her praise? She exerted herself, and did try to make her comfortable, by considering all that had passed as a mere trifle, and quite unworthy of being dwelt on. "'It might be distressing for the moment,' said she. "'But you seem to have behaved extremely well. And it is over, and may never, can never, as a first meeting, occur again, and therefore you need not think about it." Harriet said, "'Very true,' and she would not think about it. But still she talked of it. Still she could talk of nothing else. 
and Emma, at last, in order to put the Martins out of her head, was obliged to hurry on the news, which she had meant to give with so much tender caution, hardly knowing herself whether to rejoice or be angry, ashamed or only amused, at such a state of mind in poor Harriet, such a conclusion of Mr. Elton's importance with her. Mr. Elton's rights, however, gradually revived. Though she did not feel the first intelligence as she might have done the day before, or an hour before, its interest soon increased. And before their first conversation was over, she had talked herself into all the sensations of curiosity, wonder, and regret, pain and pleasure, as to this fortune at Miss Hawkins, which could conduce to place the Martins under proper subordination in her fancy. Emma learned to be rather glad that there had been such a meeting. It had been serviceable in deadening the first shock, without retaining any influence to alarm. As Harriet now lived, the Martins could not get at her, without seeking her, where hitherto they had wanted either the courage or the condescension to seek her. For since her refusal of the brother, the sisters never had been at Mrs. Goddard's, and a twelve-month might pass without their being thrown together again, with any necessity, or even any power of speech.